Thank you for joining us today. In this series, we will interview key figures within our industry and try to gain some access into their vast knowledge and their take on current market events. In today's interview, we are happy to host David Hunter, a contrarian macro strategist with four decades of experience. Hi, David. It's great hosting you and thanks for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about your professional and personal background? Sure. Um, I started in this business back in 1973, so have been in it for 49 years. Um, started on the buy side, managing money first in banks, but then uh, pension fund and insurance institutional money. Uh, and then the second half of my career has been spent as a, a macro strategist. And, you know, I was a top down manager uh, when I was running money. So it was an easy transition to the macro strategist side uh, and have been doing that since. Um, um, known as a contrarian, uh, my calls oftentimes, particularly at the turning points, are pretty opposite to what the consensus is. Um, and that I developed very early on in my career and I'm very comfortable being away from the crowd. So that's kind of kind of the nutshell of what I am. Um, and uh, my call right now is a, a bit uh, contrary to say the least, um, but uh, I think we're in a, a pretty unusual time. So first things first, what is your biggest or worst mistake um, you had in the, in the past decades of, of experience? Yeah, you, no, no, no about worse, but yeah, you do. I've always said you, you no, no money manager uh, got where he got without making mistakes along the way. And the good money managers learn from those mistakes. So as a contrarian and as a value manager, I think early on I had to learn uh, you can spot things that have value, but it doesn't mean it's going to be recognized for quite some time. So you learn along the way to be, you know, more, uh, I'm always early, but to be a little more cognizant to the fact that deep value can take some time. Um, I would say probably one, one uh, place where I learned that pretty clearly was uh, back in, um, let's see, it was 1989, I guess, 1991, I think, the uh, consumer stocks had a blow off where they doubled and doubled again in a short period of time. Uh, and there was a very clear um, there was a chart going around at that time that showed that value, that cyclical stocks, capital goods stocks, were at record lows relative to the values of consumer stocks. So as a value manager, I, I was very compelled to be in that area. And I was in that area prior to that 91 blow off. And it was an uncomfortable period um, where I was, you know, the market was roaring ahead in the consumer stocks and I was lagging way behind. So uh, and I was running uh, uh, the uh, active equity area for a big insurance company. And so I had the index guys on the other side looking great and, and pointing out every time they turned around that I was lagging by 600 basis points. So that was a, that was a big eye opener in terms of timing. Um, it didn't mean I was going to become a market timer or try to pick things and know that I, I knew I was going to be early most of the time. But it really did send home that message that you you really have to be aware that um, some of these some of these things can look great, but they can you know they can stay uh, they can languish for quite a while. Thank you. Um, so you know while you were talking, I was thinking that most of the people who watch this probably don't even realize how trading was back then. We're all used to um, signing up online to a brokerage and, and placing trades over our phone. But back then it was a whole different experience. Can can you share more about that? Sure. I can I can remember in my second job, which was around um, late 1970s, um, we had one we had one quote machine for several portfolio managers. It wasn't in our offices, it was outside my office. Um, there was one on the trading desk and that was it. And you spent most of your day not looking at prices. You might come out and check once in a while, but you literally, you didn't have com computers on your desk. 
you didn't have, you know, this was prior to uh, personal computers um, and you really didn't, you know, I can remember receiving, looking forward to receiving a, a bound chart book, you know, once a quarter to pour through. It was a very comprehensive chart book uh, to pour through the charts of the last quarter. And they were, they were um, long-term charts. So I was looking more at the long-term, but um, it, it, it was, so different than today where the information is at your fingertips constantly. You can know what's going on second to second. I argue in some ways that that's proven to be a disadvantage today because people are far too focused on the very short term because the information is so so close at hand and they really can't see the forest for the trees. You know, they're, they're so myopically focused and and it also leads to a lot of impatience because they want to see things happen quickly. And as I I use the term all the time that you know markets and cycles play out over time. You know moves play out over time, and people think that means over you know weeks, maybe a couple months. No, sometimes it's years. So you just you have to kind of step back and realize there's a bigger picture out there. How about a, a big success? Is there anything you think you can share? Uh, one, I, I did manage uh, the um, equity, the in-house equity portfolios, pension portfolios for a big Fortune 100 company, uh, Textron, and w went in there in 1981, the end of 1981. Basically, they were um, not very equity oriented. They had pulled their money out of New York banks back in the mid seventies after the bear market. And they were very focused on fixed income and private placements, but they missed the oil market in 1980 and it sent their performance down to the second quartile. So they brought me in to kind of be an opportunistic uh, equity guy that they, they, they weren't gonna embrace it completely, but they thought, you know, we might need an equity guy once in a while. So I went in there thinking I could prove that you can invest conservatively and still do well in equities and uh, basically hit the ground running in August of 1982. The first six months there, I said, let's build a, you know, a buy list and, you know, it's a bear market where there's no rush. And then in August of 1982, I went into the investment committee and said, it's time to go. And we built the portfolio. It was 50, it was a you know, small equity portfolio at the time I went in there. It was a $50 million equity portfolio when I went in. I left five years later, it was a $500 million equity portfolio. When I went in, it was 10% of assets. When I left, it was 50% of assets. And the reason I was able to do that, because they were very anti-equity or, or at least conservative uh, towards equities, but I had top percentile performance through that five years. So it, you know, every time I went in, they were skeptical, but they said, well, let's give him a little more. He's doing well. and so. It was, you know, it was a fun time. It was just, um, you know, the early 1982 to 1986, the end of 1986 was, you know, a, a beginning of this bull market that we're in now. I call it a secular bull market that started in 1982 because that's when rates started rolling over from the high double digits. Wow, it's, it's, it sounds so interesting to live through the entire you know, cycle of, Technology unfolding in front of you over the decades, um, but I'm I'm diverging. Not only technology; it's really been an amazing. If you really step back and look at, um, you know, not everybody agrees with my view that the secular bull market started in 1982 and that we're still in it. Um, but I, I have my reasons for believing that, and um, you yeah, know, that's 40 years. Um, that we've been at this from that in that one cycle. We've been through a lot in that 40 years, but to go from a period when you had, you know, mid single digit, seven, eight times earnings PEs was the market PE at the time to where we're, you know, we got up into the mid twenties, you know, before this bear market, this short bear market, um, you know, amazing time to go from 15% long bond down to, you know, 1%, um, just, really it was history and as i say people can read it in the books you know most of the younger um strategists and money managers you know they they can see it in the history books it's very different when you live it you know it's it's right there so 
Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff I can, with inflation breaking out now, I can go back and recall that period, the Volcker period, when, you know, rates took off from 9% to 15% and um, actually 7 or 8% to 15% and how dramatic a period that was. And it's not all reflected in the books. You know, some of some what you get in the books gets lost in translation. We know you as the contrarian investor. So what does it actually mean? Sure. Um, you know, con contrary means to be contrary, obviously. So uh, what typically that means for me, different contrarians do it differently. I, you know, because I'm macro based, it's oftentimes, you know, going contrary to the consensus on the market or on the economy, et cetera. But it's mostly to deal with the market. Um, and it's um, for me, I find I'm most contrary at turning points. So at major inflection points, you know, bottoms of bear markets and tops of bull markets is when you'll find me really um, opposite to the crowd. In fact, I, it's not unusual for me at the very extreme end to be almost alone, you know, that people dropped off along the way. Some people might have been bearish on the way down. Uh, I mean, uh, bullish on the way down. Um, but then, you know, it just got too much and they turned bearish with everybody else. So at, at bottoms, I can be almost alone. Uh, obviously, there'll be somebody out there, other people out there, but a uh, very small number of us who are calling a bottom at a time when everybody's bearish and calling for a lot lower. And in a similar way, at the top, you know, people at the top will be, you know, the consensus will be very bullish and I'll be saying, no, I'm very bearish or, you know, I'm, I've got a very dire forecast. And the reason for a contrarian is because investor psychology plays such a big role in markets. So um, people get most bullish at tops and most bearish at bottoms because they, as I say, they get caught up in the tape. So I can, you know, right now there's a lot of bearishness out there, which is why I'm bullish. Um, um, among other reasons, um, I can almost promise you that if we do what I'm expecting, which is a, a big uh, melt up rally into a top, that at that top next year, I'm going to be turning bearish and I'm going to be told that I'm foolish that this market has a long ways to run. Whereas right now I'm being told I'm foolish because I'm bullish. So it's, it's a nature of psychology that uh, a contrarian flips that around. And, and during the middle part, um, it's not unusual for me to be with the consensus. It's at, it's at either extreme where a contrarian tends to be quite opposite to the group, to the crowd. So you touched on, on, on the fact that, you know, you're always on the other direction. Um, so you preach on, on one thing and then, and then it happens. Um, and, uh, you know, people who are with you now, but then again, you come up with the other direction. So can, can you elaborate on, on what kind of experience that is? Are there any funny stories? Um, well, let's just say in the, in the, you know, on the way to the other extreme, it'd be crazy to, to turn, to always want to be contrary. It's not, you know, that's not the nature of it. Markets do move with the consensus during the meat of a rally. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's an experience. Let's put it this way. I'm on Twitter every day and um, you know, I get a lot of criticism out there because I'm, um, you know, my, my call right now seems rather absurd. You know, I'm saying the S and P can run to 6,000 in the next, you know, six months or less. And, and people look and say, but all this bad news around, you know, the market and, and expect the recession in 2023. And, you know, all, all the bears out there, you know, all the other strategists telling you that's going, not just going down, but going down a lot. People can't see why I could be bullish or they think I'm crazy to be bullish. And, you know, and, and the longer it takes, you know, if it takes a while to, for a country and call to work out, the, more they think you're you know you're wrong so so i get a lot you know i get a lot of criticism on on um twitter and elsewhere and and then when it does work 
it's taken a while to get there, they forget. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. The oil market. You know, I was um, back when oil was 130, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, oil spiked to 130 from had been in the mid 80s. And I said at the time, I think oil's peaking. You know, I think this is an aberration won't last long. At the time, most of the oil analysts were calling for 150 to 200. And I, and I was saying, no, we're going, we'll go back to 85 and, and below that eventually. Well, all that time it took, because for a while it you know went down to 100 and back up to 120 and then you know back down to 100 and kind of bounced around all that time they're going yeah but you're telling us it's going to ultimately go to 60 and even 30 or in the 30s and you know you're bearish and look at the you know oil and of course in the last year everybody's been bullish oil so i looked dead wrong well now we're at you know low 70s or in the mid 70s and people have moved on from it there you know some some realize where my call was but lots of people have moved on and, and don't realize that you can see out you know a contrarian does make calls that, that take time to get there but you can see it will happen it's just not going to be in a precise path that you want yeah i, I and you know a good example would be you know early 2020 COVID started, everyone thought the market's going to crash, uh, but eventually they boomed. Uh, but then again, everyone could explain, you know, why they boomed. Uh, I guess, you know, hindsight is always uh, easy to, uh, to explain uh, why. So like everybody always have their own uh, thoughts and takes on, on the market. Yeah, in, 20, in 2020, in March of 2020, when, when the S&P was 2200, I said, we're going, you know, I don't believe this is, um, I think this is temporary. I think you will see the market back up over, you know, to new highs going over 4,000. And I raised it along the way from there to ultimately 4,800 and then 5,000 and beyond. Um, and at the time, everybody was, almost everybody was saying, um, you know, we're going lower, we're going into the teens you know, this pandemic's going to be with us for a while. It's going to hurt. And so all through uh, 2020 and into 2021, the market climbed a wall of worry. And I was, you know, I stayed steadfastly bullish and kept raising my my targets. Um, and again, it comes from years and years of being contrarian. It's not easy to be outside the crowd. You know, the natural tendency for most people is to be with the crowd. They don't realize it maybe, but they're not comfortable being you know, a loner outside the crowd. I find that my, my, my best calls and some of my easiest calls are when nobody agrees with me. And that's not easy to do. Not, not a lot of people can do that. Yeah, for sure, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of character. Um, so what are the key variables uh, you look for when you analyze the markets? Um, do you favor fundamentals, uh, technical, uh, maybe a mix of the two, uh, voodoo? As I say, when people say, how do you, how do you forecast? I basically say, um, my shorthand is basically, I, I use technical analysis, I use fundamental analysis, I use um, obviously macro analysis, um, I use cross-market analysis, looking at other markets. If things confirm what I'm seeing, it helps. Uh, and then I look at sentiment. Sentiment obviously plays a big role in a contrarian analysis. So it's all of that. And when it all kind of fits together for me, it, it raises my conviction. You know, if I can, if I can confirm it through all of those things, um, it really helps to raise the conviction. If I only have pieces of it, then obviously my convictions aren't going to be as high. Um, so it's, as I say, it's the sum of all of those things because I find a lot um, that retail investors tend to want simple simple um, correlations and simple factors. I go, it's, it's a lot of multi-factor analysis. It's not you know, you can, you can, you know, people like the easy ones, like 
rates go down, market goes up or something. But you really need to understand that, you know, no one factor drives the dollar, no one factor drives the stock market, no one factor drives the bond market. There's multi factors. After spending decades on Wall Street, um, what would you say the defining differences between the rookie traders and you know, the more experienced veterans? Yeah, I think it is it is that getting going through and learning from mistakes. Basically, it is that ability to. Uh, I mean, what I back up and say is basically this is not an easy business. It it's it requires you to have kind. Of Kind of a non-linear mind you need to look at things that aren't always going to happen in a straight line in fact many times don't um and so i think the hardest thing for retail people is they want they they look at things in kind of a simplistic straight line and you know certainly the the media plays into that too because they like to give you the kind of straight picture um straight line picture and oftentimes you have to look beyond that and understand that markets are not linear and events are not linear. And you, you, know, you just have to understand that. The other thing that I think are oftentimes retail investors and traders don't understand is that um, there's a discount discounting nature of markets so that they're thinking the news today is what drives markets, but markets are often, stock markets certainly, it looks six months into the future and you can use, you know, you can draw on many different things to kind of draw conclusions for what's going to happen in many months out. And so the retail investors looking at the news that's announced today on some economic data or what have you, and they think the market's going to go down and it goes the other way and they don't understand it. That's because lots of times that, that was discounted months ago. For example, right now, um, people are talking, the big narrative on the street is that, you know, earnings estimates for the market are too high and that we're probably going to see, uh, you know, earnings estimates come down next year dramatically, maybe as much as 20 percent. And so they're saying there's going to be a time in the next few months when the market's going to have to deal with the fact that earnings estimates are too high and that they're going to, you know, trade down on, on the lower earnings estimates. I go, that, that was discounted months ago. You know, that's why we're where we are. That's why you know, in, in October, you had the S&P at 3,500 and you had lots of tech stocks down, you know, well over 50%. Um, it's, you know, it, the market looks out. It can put together a lot of pieces and know that stuff way ahead of when you think you know it and or when you're told about it. So um, I think that, uh, you know, my view is the market has did bottom on October 13th. And that we're going to, you know, look past that weak earnings in the first and second quarter. So, um, it it's uh, I think that's hard for retail people to grasp is that discounting nature of things. What's your current overview of the markets? Um, what do you focus on on the bear markets? How do you make the best of it? Sure. So so I believe we're out of the bear market. I think the bear market ended. On October thirteenth, when the you know the S and P had that last uh, swish down just below thirty five hundred, um, and I think we have begun the next leg of what I call a forty year secular bull market. So um, I think this last, and I think this is the last leg um, of the last bull leg of the bull market, and so. Um, Typically, at the end of such a long secular bull market, as I said, 40 years, um, you can see a parabolic final move, what I call parabolic blow off, uh, what I've been calling a melt up. Um, it will probably kick in that last parabolic will probably kick in after we make new highs. So I believe sometime in the first quarter, we'll see the market above 4800 again. And uh, at that point, um, you can have investors who have been bearishly positioned all this time and who believe this rally is just a bear market rally before we go lower. At some point between now and that 4,800, they're going to begin worrying that they're wrongly positioned and that the, this is a bull market. And you're going to see and you know fear of missing out. And I think you'll get a very 
very steep rally from say, you know, 4,800, 5,000 all the way up to, uh, my target is 6,000, but I think my target's gonna be low. It could be 6,500, it could be 7,000, it could be 6,200, I don't know. But I, I think we are going to see a final um, vertical move meaning you'll cover that ground from say 4,800 to 6,000 or 6,500. You'll cover that ground in a matter of you know a month or two, uh, which sounds crazy, but I think that's that will be the blow off. That will be the end stage. And, and it culminates, you know, if you step back, you understand it culminates a move that started back 40 years ago at very, very different prices. We've gone up many, many fold and it will be, I think those highs that we make in the first half of next year will will probably stand for decades, not a decade, but decades. Um, so, so in other words, we'll go through a secular bear market after that, which means you'll have cyclical bull markets after that. You know, we'll have markets that, that go on for a year or two or three on the way up, but you won't get back to those highs in each successive rollover will be at lower highs and and you'll go to lower lows so so i think we've you know so many people have grown up in this bull market you know we've had some bears along the way of course but in terms of the overall trends for 40 years it's been higher higher lows and higher highs and so it's going to be a real adjustment to go into a period where you have lower lower highs and lower lows so obviously very, very experienced. What do you do to deal with the stressful nature of trading? How do you keep emotions out of it? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Is that emotion is a big part of most investors um, experience. And the more, the more emotional you are with your investments and your portfolio, um, the, the more problematic I think your returns are gonna be. It's it's best if you can stay as objective as possible. It's easier said than done. As I said, invest investment uh, psychology, investor psychology plays a very big role, bigger role than I think most investors realize in in investing. And so, trying to minimize that psychology's effect on you, or at least understanding the psychology and working against it, uh, can serve you very well. It's, um, you know, for me, I was a natural contrarian coming in and then learned in my early years uh, the importance of or the value of that. Uh, and then having practiced it for, you know, almost 50 years now, it's easy for me to kind of be in these places where I'm totally ridiculed and looks like I'm dead wrong. And I'm just not, you know, I'm not driven by that, that psychology. Uh, I just kind of, you know, you just ignore the noise, so to speak. Um, but for most people, it's it's very hard to go outside the consensus. And I've observed this basically, not just in investing, but in society, where, you know, human nature is to want to be part of a crowd, to want, you know, there are obviously people that are very comfortable and want to be away from the crowd. But, but the vast majority of people were a social animal. They want to be part of something and they want to, you know, they want to, they don't want to be in disagreement with things. Um, and so um, it's natural for people to want to, to, to gravitate towards the consensus, to gra gravitate towards what's the general view out there. And I see it in, in politics in you know, life situation, everything else that, um, a lot of times I think people are easily influenced just because that's where everybody is. And rather than think for themselves and say, yeah, that doesn't make sense to me. So for, for a natural contrarian, it's a, a very different experience. I'm, I'm, you know, it doesn't bother me to be uh, totally differentiated from the crowd. So not a trading advice, uh, but with your perspective and experience, Looking to the future, what would be a good uh, sector or instrument to pay attention to? Yeah, what I will say is I think uh, I'll answer that in two different time frames. I think um, going into this next, uh, you know, this bull leg, I think it's going to be broad based. 
So that means you're going to see both growth and value play and see both small cap and large cap play. You know, I have a, a target on the Russell 2000 of, of 3000. So that's the small cap sector. Um, so not only is it the S&P going up, you know, more than 50 percent, I have the NASDAQ going to 20,000. So the tech will play, the, you know, the growth will play. Um, so that's in in this period in the next six months. I think it's going to be broad based. You have a lot of people talking about a narrow market and how growth is dead and you know all that. But I, I do think it's going to be bro it'll broaden out as we go. Um, on a longer term basis, um, once we get to this top and we go through a bear market, and I think it's going to be a historic bear market, maybe the biggest one in in you know since 1929. So maybe 80 percent bear market uh, in the latter part of 2023 and into 2024. Uh, once we get beyond that bear market, the next cycle, which will be a recovery cycle, but it won't won't be in a secular bull, but you'll have a recovery cycle in stocks. It'll be very different leadership. So going forward from say 2024 to the end of the decade, the area that I think will lead by far will be commodities. So commodities are, they've come alive in the last couple of years, um, but what's coming will be a, what I think will be a spectacular commodity cycle where you'll see, uh, and it includes energy, you'll see oil go, I believe oil could get down into the 30s during next year's recession bust, I call it a global bust, what's coming. Um, uh, I think it can fall as low as the mid 30s. From there, uh, starting in, say, 2024, I think you'll see it ramp up to as high as $400 a barrel. So so we're looking at, and that's what I mean by a super commodity cycle, I think silver, which is currently, uh, say, $22, $23, um, can run up to as much as 50 or 60 in the next six to nine months, then get hit in the bust, and after the bust in say 2024 to 20, you know, to 2030, I think silver will run to four or 500. You know, gold, same thing, can run to 3,000 pre-bust. After the bust, could run to 15 or 20,000. So we're looking at some, you know, and, and all commodities. I think ag commodities, wheat, corn, soybeans, um, you know, lumber. Lots of things are going to go through the roof. Uh, lots of, you know, the, the base metals, copper will go through the roof, et cetera. So, um, so we're looking at a very big inflationary cycle following the bust. The bust will take, will wind out inflation, which is, you know, second half of next year and, and into the first half of 2024. It will probably, we'll probably get a, a small, quick deflationary um, period, and then we'll start in you know starting in late 2024 or mid 2024 start a cycle that will take inflation all the way up over 20 percent so you know we'll be looking at basically totally retracing the move from the early 80s to you know back up to even new highs on inflation and inflation was 21 percent i think in 1981 you know, so people are talking now about 10% and, you know, upset about 10%. I think by the end of the decade, we'll have gone from negative inflation in, say, 2024 to uh, potentially 25% inflation by the end of the decade. It won't be pretty. Okay, well, <laughs> super interesting. I definitely wrote some notes. Um, not a specific question, but your take on crypto? Yeah, I don't follow crypto. I have been in the few times I've commented on it, I've been pretty skeptical because I said what I what bothers me about it, and I'm I'm the first one to say I'm not you know it's not an area I follow, so I, I people should not pay much attention to my views. But what bothered me in looking at it over the last few years is the speculative nature of everything that people are chasing returns there. You know they're 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 letting the narrative be driven by the excitement of the returns that were there. And, and that combined with what I call the Austrian hatred for central banking, it was a, it was a nice 
you know, fit. They could see uh, a system outside of central banking. Um, and so they, you know, the narrative grew up around those two things. And you're seeing now, you know, certainly the speculative uh, juices unwind uh, as as prices came down and, you know, FTX, obviously. So I'm I'm really skeptical about, I'm not saying there won't be, you know, that Bitcoin won't survive or that there won't be, a, you know, a digital currency out there in the future. But I just think a lot of the narrative that's kind of driven it for the last few years is is more based on greed than it is on reality. And I think that greed's getting unwound right now. Uh, as I've said, my cop out or my, my answer to everybody that asked me to comment on crypto is, Let's see it get through the bust. You know, let's see what happens in the second half of next year when when we have an economy that is worse than anything we've seen in the post World War II era, and when we have potentially a financial crisis bigger than anything we've had since the 30s. Let's 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 see um, how crypto holds up then. If it can you know survive that and come out the other side, then maybe there's something to look at. But you know, we're already seeing obviously some some real troubling signs. So uh, we've seen a lot of people uh, joining and discovering trading and investing, uh, especially in the last two years. Um, so with your uh, experience, any words of wisdom for them? Yeah, I've kind of alluded to some of them. The, the things I would say, just understand, um, you know, too many people put more time into um, researching, purchasing a washing machine than they do researching their portfolio, you know, what they're going to put in their portfolio or how they're going to invest. Oh, so, first of all, understand this is your money. This is your hard earned money. You need to, um, you need to be careful. Now for a lot of people, they probably need financial advisors. You know, that uh, I see on Twitter an awful lot. Uh, it goes back to the comments we had about technology and computers early on. There's so much available at your fingertips. You may think you can do it yourself, and certainly, you know, the the trading platforms and everything out there make it uh, compel people to do that. But people don't realize that they don't have much experience, and that they're going to probably have, unless they're unless they're lucky, they're going to get their head handed to them going into an area where they have so little knowledge. They may think they know something because they had some early success, but it's it's amazing to see when things turn to adverse, when adversity hits, how quickly they realize they don't really know what they're doing. So, uh, I, I you know first and foremost to me is be aware this is your hard earned money. You don't you don't want to just gamble it away. And that's the other thing I would say tied to that is I see an awful lot of people out there who really think investing in the stock market or stock options, et cetera, they really treat it like they treat a, a gambling, um, you know, sports gambling or something. It's, and, I, you know, this is, if, if you really want to build a nest egg, if you really want your hard earned money to earn a return, you need to understand a lot. And I think far too many retail investors doing it themselves are not nearly equipped to deal with some of what they need to know, you know, they, so, you know, invest in lots of books. I, by the way, one book I, I always recommend to every, every investor is a book that I read in 1977. There's been new iterations since the, the authors passed away, but uh, a fellow named David Dreamin, uh, he was a Canadian um, and he used to have a, a you know, weekly, um, uh, I think he had a weekly uh, article in Forbes. You know, he was a regular in there. Um, and he has his own investment firm. But uh, he was a noted contrarian. And he wrote a book back in um, 1977 called, I think it was The Psychology of the Stock Market, I think was what the original title was. His later ones that were, I think the one that I typically tell people to look for is um, Contrarian Investment Strategies. Uh, I'm not sure the last year he wrote, but it might have been late 90s. Um, but it's it's a it's a book that can you know uh, stand for the ages. 
The reason I recommend that first and foremost is it really sends home that message of how important or the big role that investment psychology plays in investing. And I think that's a very important early lesson for all investors because psychology does play such a big role. And people can be looking at price earnings ratios and everything else if they don't understand, you know, the movement of the market is driven by moods and psychology um, and particularly driven by the tape, you know, what I call the tape, which is the, you know, market movement, um, you know, then, then they're going to get lost. So that's, that's very interesting. I definitely wrote some notes. Uh, at this point, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, I think it was a very, very interesting interview. And I see, I see a follow up interview in the future. Um, thank you very much, David. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, you know, I, I think we are in for, uh, I think 2023 is setting up to be a very historical year. So I just say to everybody, fasten your seatbelts. I think this is going to be quite a ride. Um, by the way, if people want to follow me, they can follow me on Twitter. My uh, handle, I'm sure you'll probably put it out there, but my handle is um, at Dave H. Contrarian. And I should just caution people. Um, as is true of a lot of people with big followings. Um, there are a lot of fake accounts out there. They'd like to take your profile picture, uh, make it look like your account, and they just change a letter in the, in the um, username, you know, one or two letters, and people get fooled thinking it's me. So, you know, I've got 190,000 followers that built up over many years. Um, I've never purchased one. There's a guy out there telling people that I that I buy my followers. I've never bought one. I started, I can remember in probably four or five years ago, I had 600 followers. And, uh, you know, a lot of the followers came along during the 2020, 2021 period because I was uniquely bullish. Um, but whatever, um, you know, just be careful because most of those fake accounts will have small numbers of followers. If you see that, you know, it's not me. And if you're careful, you'll look at the username and realize they misspelled contrarian or, you know, they called it David H or something like that. So just be aware, there are a lot of fake out, uh, accounts out there trying to solicit people pretending it's me. Well, I sure hope I'm, I'm talking to the original today. <laughs> yeah, you can't change the face. <laughs> so once again, David, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Until next time, I wish you successful and responsible trading. Good day.